Hello everyone, today I want to talk about self-driving cars and the perception part of self-driving cars. This is the main, one of the main components of self-driving cars that enables the cars to perceive the environment and to make sense of the um, sensory input that it makes from um, the sensors put on top of the car. This is part of the, uh, our course on techniques for self-driving cars given by uh, Soros Stachnitz, me and uh, Nive Chabolu and uh, Benedikt Mersch and in the end also Igor uh, Bogoslavsky. And um, as I said, today we will cover the perception part of self-driving cars. So, but when we look at perception, so here, for instance, uh, is given an image um, um, captured from um, camera, uh, which is on board of the, on the car. Um, and this shows a street scene that is, was captured here in Bonn. So here in the back, you can also see the main building of the university. And you can see here some intersection and we are on this uh, right turn part here of this intersection and this is this is a typical view we'll, which you will get when you have a self-driving car so but what are the inform, important parts here so um, the important parts are for, of course first of all the moving objects there so the other traffic participants like cars bicyclists but also the pedestrians that are standing here on the right side which we need maybe to um, consider when we are driving. Are they just uh, jaywalking over the street or they're just standing there or waiting there? What do they do? But as you might not have noticed, here's also a bicyclist waiting on this, uh, on this traffic light. So these are all the information we need. So the traffic passer depends. But of course, we also need some information about the traffic signs because these can also change over time. Even if we have a map representation of the environment, the traffic signs can change or can be removed or uh, altered in different ways, which is not represented maybe in the map. Um, then we need, of course, also the traffic lights. So we need the position of the lights and we need to distinguish between different states of the lights because these are the main, uh, uh, main things here. And then we have to maybe obey the tra traffic rules because when the lights are not working, then the traffic signs apply. So then we have, this is, this is, a, this is a, a traffic rule we have to obey here. So these are a lot of information that we need um, on top of this. But when we also look at, it, uh, at the, the other types of information which we need to actually drive, we also need the space where we can drive, such as roads, the road surface is shown here in purple. And on top of this, also the parts where we don't, uh, we are not allowed to drive, some, uh, something like the sidewalk, because there cars usually should not drive around. And on top of this, we also need some high-level information about the road. That means we need to know where are the lanes, uh, shown here in lighter purple, but where are also maybe parts of the environment where the cars also not, even if it's drivable, usually should not, uh, should not uh, drive, because this is, uh, for instance, here a bike lane. So only bikes uh, should be there. But we also maybe use this information to anticipate that maybe a, a bicycle is coming from behind. But we also need the information about the poles here on the sidewalk. So this is a, maybe not the best place to park. So therefore we need this information also. So this is, this is something like a semantic segmentation of the environment. But to come back to the traffic signs, for instance, we have also to associate the traffic signs to the lanes because the lanes apply, uh, the traffic signs apply only to specific lanes and all this information is integrated and must be integrated. And as I said, even if we have the, um, even if we have high definition uh, maps of the environment, we still need to maybe consider that changes happens in the environment and therefore the perception part we are talking about uh, today is the it's one main component of all self-driving cars. So the contents of this lecture are that we give a, a overview of the perception stack, um, uh, some basic overview of the perception stack of a self-driving car, but we also will cover some perception tasks. And specifically we cover in this lecture the object detection based on camera images. So coming to the perception suite of self-driving cars, so when you look around on the, self, uh, on the space of self-driving cars, starting with the research-driven uh, self-driving cars, but also more advanced cars that are now produced by large companies like Google or, some, or, or Ford or something like this, they all share that they have a, a whole suite of different sensors on top. So most cars will feature, for instance, 
um, cameras. So these are the main sensors that are used to distinguish, for instance, traffic signs or the state of uh, traffic lights, because this information you cannot easily get from the other sensors like a LiDAR. Because a LiDAR gives you a point cloud, but will not give you some color information which you maybe need to distinguish different states also of other cars. So the blinking and such things and the braking lights and something like this. But also cars contain a radar. Coming now to, this, uh, to the sensors we just which I covered here. So the main sensor is the camera. So the camera um, is like shown here. Um, usually on top of the car which can cover the, the, whole, space, the, the whole view of the environment. And um, the interesting thing about this is that cameras are advanced so much that we even have it now on mobile phones everywhere. So they are getting pretty cheap. So they, we can place as many, basically many cameras as we want basically on autonomous cars. And this is also done. So usually we have not only front looking car cameras, but also look at car cameras to the side or to the back. And um, most uh, luxury cars, but also more consumer, cars already have cameras on board. So most of the cars already have, like here in this example, um, already car cameras mounted, for instance, in a stereo setup. That means two cameras that are looking forward to uh, do also per depth perception, for instance, for um, distance keeping uh, uh, functionality, but also to de uh, detect traffic signs. So also um, a lot of cars have this. This is, uh, this is an advantage. So we not, don't need actually to outfit or retrofit our car with some cameras because they are already on board. So um, the, the information that we get from it is a high resolution so that we get a, a clear view of the environment where we can also distinguish uh, details of the environment and the color information which I said is very important for instance for distinguishing different states of the traffic lights. <coughs> um, one disadvantage of uh, cameras is that they are strongly uh, illumination dependent. So that means if we have some sunlight that is blinding the camera, we cannot see something with the camera. But also the reliance on lighting information uh, requires us at night to um, have some additional uh, light to see something. So this is why we had headlights when we drive around. Um, but this is maybe in the disadvantage when we have, for instance, uh, sideways looking cameras, um, then we need some light on the sides to see something. Um, the other main sensor of self-driving cars, of most self-driving cars, um, is the LiDAR sensor. Um, LiDAR sensors are usually placed uh, above the, the car so that only maybe one sensor is needed to cover the whole uh, view field of the sensor. So these sensors are usually rotating and measuring the distances to the environment and generating a point cloud. So um, the, the big advantage of LiDAR sensors is that we don't need any additional light. So they can even measure distances at night and um, can provide us with point cloud information even in the night. And this is a big advantage, so therefore they, they are usually uh, also equipped on cars. And the big disadvantage of these lighters, that's also the reason why they are just placed one sensor on top of the cars, so to cover the whole field of view, because they are quite expensive. They are far more expensive than cameras. Um, but um, yeah, this, this is the, the main disadvantage of lighters. Um, and they provide somehow a mid-resolution. So in between cameras and the next sensor, we will cover radars. So radars are also a quite major technology that is already um, present in most cars, like here in this uh, uh, Audi, um, where we can see here uh, two radar sensors placed in front of the car, which measure the, the, the position, but also the velocity. So this is the main, info, the main advantage of radar above the LiDAR or the uh, camera, that we can directly measure the, uh, the velocity of the, uh, ob uh, of the objects in the, in the surrounding. Um, here are uh, some examples from uh, a, a car, from um, um, supplier, from uh, radars. Um, they look like something like this, these boxes. Um, as I said, it's a pretty major technology, so you can find it in ships, but also in aircraft, and so they, they are pretty, pretty advanced. Um, really. So um, the disadvantage is that the lidars, uh, the, the radars provide only a very low resolution um, view of the environment, and they are quite sparse. So therefore, um, as uh, most, um, uh, therefore we, we need uh, some other information to really perceive the environment. 
Other sensors that are also equipped already in cars are like the ultrasonic sensors, but they are only uh, for the near range. So when you want to park somewhere or something, then you use usually the ultrasonic sensors. Then the GPS information, of course, that gives you a global positioning information, um, which can help you to yeah, somehow localize yourself in the environment, which is also, as you might know, already in navigation systems used and everywhere, also in your, uh, on your smartphone. Um, the inertial measurement units uh, is giving us information about the velocity, so how the car moves, um, and gives you measurements about this. And then uh, the odometer, which is maybe usually used for the wheels, gives you also velocity information. These, these, uh, most of these sensors are already equipped on normal cars. We don't need to do anything else uh, for this. So, but as I said, all the sensors, also the other sensors I discussed, have some advantages and disadvantages. So usually the, the um, self-driving car, car companies equip uh, multiple sensors or many sensors like cameras, radar and ultrasonic sensors on the car to get uh, uh, the advantages of all the sensors but also to complement each other to get rid of the disadvantages. So for instance uh, when we have a LiDAR we can easily sense at night and use then this information to drive uh, around. When we are on, on, on daylight uh, conditions, we can maybe rely mostly on the, on the camera, but we can supplement this by the precise distance measurements from the LiDAR to give us information about the environment. Um, so, but the, the problem here is that we, of course, we have now multiple sensor streams that give us different information and we have to aggregate this information. And this is usually called sensor fusion. Um, we will not cover this part here, but this is an important part you have to remember when we are talking about using multiple sensors. It has not only um, a great disadvantage, but it has also maybe the disadvantage that we have to fuse the sensor information from the sensors. In this lecture, we will mainly focus on the perception for um, cameras. And for this perception on cameras, there are different uh, tasks that are usually discussed. So the classification means that we have maybe in, um, a region which we want to classify, something like uh, traffic signs in this example, where we just want to assign each of these images one label, um, like uh, different, uh, different states of the traffic signs. Um, in the semantic uh, segmentation, this is uh, brought a step further where we have um, a semantic label shown here in colors like the road surface, the, um, um, the sidewalks, the pedestrians and um, the, the, the fences on the side. Um, here um, we have a semantic label for each pixel. So it's not only providing a label for the complete image, but for pixel-wise labels which is important, as I shown, to maybe distinguish different lanes, but also to distinguish where is drivable space and where is not drivable space. And coming to the next part, where we want to, on top of this, also localize the objects. So we, uh, we basically, it's um, um, the detection part here is that we want to localize by a bounding box the, uh, the, the objects in the surrounding. And uh, we want also to classify them so that we distinguish different objects in the environment. And um, now getting a little bit more complex, so not only detecting the objects in the environment, but also providing so-called instance information. That means um, in the semantic segmentation, we would have here all classified as cars, but in instance segmentation, the task is to distinguish different instances of cars, so different objects uh, pixel-wise. Um, the thing is that um, this instance segmentation is now subsumed by uh, the panoptic segmentation, which combines instance, segmenta combines instance segmentation and semantic segmentation. So you will um, see more of this work happening in the research uh, concentrating on panoptic segmentation, where you not only get for each pixel a semantic label, but also for the so-called thing classes, so classes that can be instantiated. Um, the instance ID, so that you can distinguish here, as you see, different cars with different uh, with different instances, and this is the information that um, autonomous vehicles might need. Um, in this class, we will focus on uh, one task, the detection, and we will discuss in depth the detection of uh, the, um, the detection part. Um, but first, what is the goal of an object detector? 
So we have here again our image from before and we have now localized the car. So the, the input to an object detection approach is of, of course an RGB image. So a normal camera image which we captured from the autonomous car. Um, the desired output is that we can localize the car by a bounding box that is drawn around this uh, and the confidence value. So that means how sure we are about that this is really a car or some other object. For representing the binding boxes, there are now uh, uh, multiple possible ways that are uh, present in the literature. Something like pre representing the binding box by the upper left corner, um, it's the image coordinate x, y, and the width and the height of the binding box. This is one representation. Often you will also see another representation, that the binding box is represented by the center of the binding box and the height and the width of the binding box, which is uh, also uh, a common representation you will see. And the last representation that is also sometimes uh, needed or used that because it has some advantages is that you represent the bonding box by two coordinates. So the upper left and the lower right uh, 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 corner of the bonding box. And these are the different ways to represent the bonding boxes. So when we now come to the detection part, how it, uh, how it is actually carried out, the general approach, so this is the, the main theme of object detectors, is that you um, first extract some regions from the uh, environment and then you do some classification on top of this environment, uh, on, on this, uh, this region by extracting first a feature. So this is a representation that is somehow a vector or something like this that you can use in a classification approach. And then you have a classifier that gives you a confidence value, is this really a car? And then you would um, say, okay, in this, in this case this represents not a car, when you extract another region um, and you would compute from this a feature, so this is now a different feature vector because the content of the image part is a different thing. So then the classifier would in a case say that something like this, okay, this is to 0.9 a car. So it's pretty sure that this is a car. So the thing how to extract now um, the, um, the, the windows from the, or the regions from the image is, uh, is one thing that is called sliding window approach. So as you have seen, when I go back, is that the, the idea is to slide a window of a particular size over the image and at each location classify this, uh, this window. And as you see here, when it's, uh, uh, it's going over the cars, then the, the classification approach gives us a high probability and this will result in the spawning boxes. Um, but as you can see also from this example is that, um, of course, the the classifier will also give us detections or high, high confidence uh, values for um, regions where the car is not perfectly in the center but maybe also on the side because this is also something we want to have in the end that even if the car is on the side of the, the image we can even detect this car and this will also result here in multiple detections on one single car. So the question is now in the end we want to know maybe also that there's only one car and not two cars on the same place in, in the space. And for this, we have to do something that's called non-maximum suppression. That is usually a part that is uh, applied in the end on the detections that the object detector gives us and um, gets rid of the, the bonding boxes that are maybe not um, directly on the car or have a, the, the highest confidence. And for this, we want to keep only the high confident detections and we want to remove all the um, non-maximum bonding boxes that are not overlapping. So the question is now, how do we say something is overlapping in, in, in terms of bonding boxes? And for this, we need the concept of intersection over union. And the intersection over union, like the name says, is just computing the intersection of two bonding boxes, which is this, this, colored, uh, uh, this red colored region here of the two bonding boxes divided by the union of the whole areas. So we're dividing two areas. And this gives us a value between 0 and 1. The higher, the more overlapping the, the bounding boxes are, and the lower, the, the, the less overlapping the bounding boxes are. And using this, we can now apply this to the non-maximum suppression. So first, we sort the bounding boxes by the confidence scores. So let's, for this example, say this is the highest scored bounding box because it's directly centered on the, on the car. So this is what we want. And we, we look then uh, for each bounding box, is it overlapping with some other bounding boxes? And if this surpasses a threshold, something like 0 0.5, um, then we just drop this bounding box if there is a higher scoring bounding box around. So in this case, 
there's no bonding box around, so we just keep this bonding boxes. The next bonding box is maybe this uh, from has a slightly lower uh, confidence score, but still is on the car, but has now um, other bonding box around it that has a too high overlap. So that means we just drop this bonding box. Going further, we have this bonding box, there's nothing overlapping, so we can keep it. We, we, have, the, um, we have another bonding box that is on top of this, the too large overlap, so we drop it, and then we have this, and we drop this also. So and in the end, after the maximum suppression, as you can see here, we have two distinct bonding boxes here, which is also, uh, in this case, a very good thing, because we, it's also on top of a car. And this is what about, was our um, um, objective here. In the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the introduction lecture, Cyril talk, talked about um, data sets and that data sets are important to measure how good our algorithms are and also to somehow evaluate how the, the car would act maybe in the real world. And for this, we have also object detection data, uh, uh, um, object detection data sets, something like Pascal Wok, um, the ImageNet data set, MS Coco or the Elvis data set, providing uh, um, um, always um, getting more complex tasks for the object detection things. As you can see here, um, the object detection data sets, as I said, the, the PASPA uh, visual object uh, competition um, provides something around uh, 12k uh, images, so 12,000 images with 20 categories. It was from uh, 2012. And as you can see, over time, the, the task get, uh, got more complex and uh, also the number of classes increases. And you see here, from instance, the, one of the newest data sets from 2019 has already 1,000 different classes and uh, quite a uh, high number of images that you can use to learn approaches but also to evaluate approaches. So usually the data sets are associated with some subset where you can um, learn or uh, develop your approach on and some subset which is called the test set where you evaluate the, the approach on. And as you can see, here now the open images, that is an ever-growing set of images um, providing 600 categories has over 1.9 million images that you can use to train an uh, algorithm but also to test it. The disadvantages of these data sets are the, they are captured from image databases like F uh, Flickr or something like this, Pinterest or so. They are just collected from the internet, then annotated by annotators on uh, annotation services and then um, they show, of course, only handheld cameras, mostly, or smartphone cameras. So therefore, um, lately or recently, we, we also see data sets that are specifically targeted at, at uh, autonomous cars. So showing real images captured from an autonomous car. Um, the most famous one is the Kitty data set uh, recorded in Karlsruhe. Um, showing uh, such images. We have the Argoverse from Ford. We have the new scenes from Adapt uh, Aptiv or Montreal, I think they are now called, uh, and Waymo, of course. So um, here's also some statistics on this. So the Kitty dataset was one of the earliest datasets showing uh, really images from an autonomous car or some car that was equipped with, an, with a camera. Um, then we have from Baidu some dataset uh, that come up to something around 2017. Um, and then you see here a proliferation of, of data sets in the last year which came up. So that, that's quite interesting and also quite exciting because we have real data from the, from the cars that are maybe driving even around, like the Waymo car that is now also autonomously driving and giving some passenger services in, in, in the US. So these are then really captured data from the uh, original, um, original self-driving car. And as you can see also here is the trend, uh, uh, you can see a trend that um, over time the data sets get larger and more varied, also showing more edge cases in the end and uh, getting more challenging. Um, but the question is now, when we come to the data sets, I talked about that there's usually a train set and a test set. How do we actually evaluate it on the test set? So and for this, we have to figure out how to compare or how to measure the, the progress of the object detection and how do, do we evaluate different object detection approaches. So how do we decide which maybe object detector we are putting on our car in the end when we have different, uh, uh, um, different options? And then we have to ask ourselves how do we actually say that the detection is uh, correct in the end because as you can see here 
these are some predictions. So we have also maybe multiple predictions for some car and we have to say, okay, this is a correct one for a car. Um, this is a, a, this is an incorrect one for a car. These are correct ones and this is also correct. And how do we do we do the evaluation here? And for this, we have the concept of ground truth bounding boxes. So these are the annotated bounding boxes, which are given with the data set together, um, which are shown here by a solid line. And we have predictions bounding boxes um, that are showing by the dashed lines as before. And now we define using the overlap uh, concept from before that a match, so that means um, a prediction that matches basically a ground truth is defined as something that is, uh, has an overlap larger than a, a certain threshold and usually something like 0 0.5 is a good threshold to say this is a match but also higher values are possible here of course. So the higher the threshold you, you, you want to have the more accurate the approach needs to be to really say, okay, this is a correct prediction in the end. And when we talk about predictions, we have also to talk about what is a true and a false positive. So this was also co uh, covered in the MSR course, but I just recap it here. So that means um, in this case, how do we do this actually when we have certain detections with certain, detec uh, with certain confidence scores as shown here. So um, it's just assigned this, co this confidence scores and um, each color corresponds then to some bounding box like this. So the, the purple bounding box has the highest confidence, that's here. The green bounding box is here, has a lower confidence and the blue bounding box and the red bounding box. So for matching now the predictions to ground truths, because we might have multiple predictions lying on the same ground truths, we are now using a greedy matching approach. So as I said, we first sort our predictions by the score and then we go from the highest scoring uh, bounding box down uh, to the lowest scoring bound, bounding box and look if this is correct. So this is a similar procedure as the non-maximum suppression as before. So um, when we look at the, the first bounding box, we have the purple bounding box. This is overlapping to a certain threshold with the, uh, with the, uh, with the ground truths. So um, we say this is a correct bounding box, but what we also do in this procedure, we remove the grounding box, uh, the ground truth bounding boxes from the available grounding boxes, uh, ground truth bounding boxes, because now what happens in the next step, so the blue bounding box is also correct, it has a, a large enough overlap with the bounding box, so this is also correct, and what now happens is that because we remove the bounding boxes, the ground truth bounding boxes, we have this bounding box that might have had a high enough overlap um, um, has now no bounding box available in a ground truth. So that means this will be uh, labeled as incorrect. And then we have this bounding box that is maybe also correct and then we have this bounding box that has no thing uh, lying near to it or is l largely overlapping with, so this is also incorrect. So with this information, so the true positives are the bounding boxes that are on top of uh, the, the correct ones and the false positives that are not on the correct ground truth bounding box. Um, we can use this then to compute something that's called prediction and uh, pre precision and recall. So um, as I said, this was already covered in uh, uh, mobile sensing and robotics, but to just give you here the reminder basically, so we have the precision that is the number of from the correctly matched divided by the number of the predictions. So that gives us this, the score, how many of the predictions are actually correct. And the recall is then giving us how many of the ground truth bounding boxes have been found. So usually you both, uh, both values range between zero and one, and you usually want to have a high precision and high recall at the same time. So both should reach one in the end. So that's the optimum you want to have. Um, to uh, then actually come to the object detection uh, measure we, we're usually using, um, we, we have to talk about the precision recall curve. The precision recall curve just puts this number, so we calculated here the precision and the recall for all the, for the, all the bounding boxes into a precision recall plot. So that means uh, we start with the highest confidence score and plot it at the, at the um, precision and the recall, so we have a precision of 100%, but only a recall of 1.6, so we are here somehow, and if we now uh, do this for all the points, we can get such a curve. So the, in the ideal case, if we matched all the uh, ground truth bounding boxes, we just would have here a box, something like this. But this is usually not happening, because you have always some, some uh, minor errors 
there. Um, what now is done is that we um, want to have the interpolated uh, 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 position recall curve, which is just taking for each value, for this value here for instance, the, the maximum position to the right side. So and this gives you the basically the upper bound. Because the argument is that we would give up a little bit of the uh, uh, of the um, um, we we would choose a threshold here on this confidences which is a little bit higher to just get a, a higher recall, for instance. So and um, this is usually the the case here. So we have the interpolated uh, PR, PR curve, and now coming to the actual measure we are reducing in the end. So we are not using precision or recall in the end. We are using the area under the uh, under the uh, precision recall curve. In the area, this is usually called average precision, is just um, the 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 approximation of the area under the curve, and this is done uh, by this 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 um, this interpolation here. So we have eleven values on the um, on the recall uh, axis, and then we just measure how much is the precision on these values and then we um, just divide it by the average of these values so we have then the average position at this recall points. And typical values for this interpolation are something like on Kitty like 11 or 40 are used for these things and for the Coco data set maybe 101. So the thing is here the more points you choose uh, to interpolate the more accurate the estimate of the area gets. So and the, the, uh, the, the, the points are here used um, to make the com uh, computation a little bit faster, especially if you have uh, many bounding boxes or yet you have to score, um, then it gets a, a little bit complicated there. So, and the average position is the area under the uh, position recall curve, and when we have multiple classes, then we just average over the average position, uh, position um, to get the mean average position, so MAP. And, um, in the case of the MS Coco dataset, they also want to evaluate how precise certain object detectors go. So we have this matching um, score, Tata IOU, and they use multiple of these thresholds. So, and by using this, they can then aggregate um, the different points of uh, matching scores. Um, now we know how to evaluate the detectors and uh, which data sets are there, then we have to talk about what are the detectors now, or modern detectors. So first covering some traditional detectors, or just um, summarizing some traditional detectors here. So the traditional detectors, uh, we're using this, this aforementioned procedure. So extracting region, calculating some feature on this region, and then doing classification. The, uh, one of the most famous ones is the Viola-Jones uh, detector for uh, um, faces, which is using very basic features, so these Haar-like features here, um, which are just differences of different regions, and it's very simple to calculate, but also therefore very fast. So this approach was able around 2000 to, convert to with high precision to detect um, faces in, in, in uh, uh, camera images. So coming to a more complex uh, representation for a per person specifically uh, introduced is the histogram of gradients. So here you have, um, uh, you subdivide the image in different regions and then you make a histogram of the gradients in this, in this part of the image. So as you can see it's far more complex than you're just using the differences of different regions. And then you then come to the so-called deformable part model, there you have multiple multiple levels of histograms of uh, gradients. So you have the root level where you detect, where you maybe distinguish here the, the outer part of the, the object, so the root level, and then you have parts that can be deformed in the object to further um, improve the detection because the idea is that maybe when you have only part of the bicycle visible that you still detect some uh, other wheel of the vehicle. And this was the most basically advanced uh, method before uh, the modern uh, object detectors came. So the main innovation that you have here is that the, the features get better. So you improve the features, you make, put more engineering in designing the features or getting the aggregated features and then you get usually better performance. So that's where the traditional and then came now the modern. This is the thing that we focus more on this in, in this lecture is the modern object detectors. The modern object detectors basically rely on a method called convolutional neural networks, which is basically a way to 
get better features in the end and also to classify better. So, and in general, there are two basic paradigms uh, possible for the object detection. It's the so-called two-stage approaches where we first extract regions like before in a general ob object detection paradigm and then classify each of these regions. This is a so-called two-stage approach because we have this proposal phase and you have the classification phase. And then you have the single stage which uh, directly produces the bounding boxes without this intermediate extraction of regions. Um, but first we have to talk about convolutional neural networks because this is the main part we also have to get um, for understanding modern approaches. So in this, the, the goal of this lecture is not to give you a complete overview of the complete um, convolutional neural network or theory on neural networks, but give you the, the bits and uh, things that you might uh, or you, that you need to know to understand uh, the, the literature that you have to maybe read in a seminar, but also when you look over the papers more in detail. So convolutional network, neural networks were all around uh, for a long time. So there were up and downs in the development. There were great excitement in the 80s about neural networks. Then people found out, yeah, there are some restrictions. And yeah, in the, in the, in the beginning of 90, uh, 2000, there were also quite a, a, a quite good approaches, for instance, to, ins uh, to distinguish postal codes on cards and something like this. The, the work of LeCun comes to mind. Um, but they were not really the main focus of vision research in the end. This changed drastically as the uh, so-called ImageNet challenge uh, was uh, happening in 2012, because there was one approach that drastically um, uh, reduced the error rates compared to the other approaches before. So before you saw some uh, uh, diminishing returns on the approaches so that over time it got a little bit better, but this approach was 10% better than the, in the error rate than the other competing traditional approaches. And this approach um, was here this um, so-called AlexNet or the, the work by Alex Kraszewski um, from the University of Toronto together with uh, Geoffrey Hinton. And they made it work on real data that is not just um, small numbers or something like this. So on a real, he showed the community, the computer vision community, but also everywhere, that convolutional neural networks are something that is quite interesting and in giving you uh, much better results than the traditional approaches where a lot of engineering is needed to figure out how the features are. Um, and as I said here in this part, I just want to give you an uh, overview of the uh, ingredients of convolutional neural networks and also give you some insights on the terms used usually when you just look in the, in the, uh, in the papers. So, but when we talk about convolutional networks, then the first part you have to talk about is convolutions because it's a part of the uh, convolutional network term here. And um, as before with the sliding window, convolutions are nothing else than sliding over the, the image and producing numbers. So here the image is represented here. This is a gray valued image. It's just by, by numbers between 0 and 255. And then you can apply the convolution that's defined like this, where you have the, the image like I and the kernel that is sliding over this. I will shortly show how this actually works. Um, one note here, in the, the usual convolution is defined as uh, using the minus, which is somehow counterintuitive because you have to flip the kernel in the end. So what is usually done also in most uh, deep learning frameworks is just using the cost correlation. The only difference is here that we are not using the minus here, but the plus, which gives us some advantages when we are computing the numbers. So just for an example here, so you, you already should know how the convolution works, so just a reminder. Um, is how we apply the convolution on this, uh, on this part of the image. This is the convolutional kernel that has some weights inside there. So these are now fixed in this case. Um, and then we uh, compute the value um, um, with this window by just putting the window on top of the uh, image and then using just the minus one for this value, the minus two for this value and so on and so on. And then we get in the end this. So it is just a weighted sum of uh, the image content in a certain region of the image. And as I said, we uh, shift the window a little bit further and compute the next value. We do this over and over again. And in the end, we will have here the result of the convolution. So the special thing about this is that we don't want to have specific uh, fixed values in a convolutional network, but the trick is to learn the weights actually. So we have here 
the weights of the, the, the convolution are the thing that we want to learn from data. So this is the thing that we want to adjust automatically. When we talk about convolutions, we have also to talk about that, the fact that when you apply the convolution, you have maybe seen before, uh, when we apply the convolution, then the, the image is basically shrinking because we can only apply the filter in the edges of the images, um, or on the corner of the images. So they, they are losing something. So when we have this situation, we speak of um, that we have no padding um, to, to, to guarantee that we can place the um, filters everywhere. We get a reduced size of the filtered image. So that looks something like this. So the, the, the size is basically reduced by, by the kernel size. Um, but usually we don't want to have this in a convolutional network. Um, and therefore we introduce the concept of zero padding. So we just put um, a border around the image which is initialized with zero, and then we can place basically the uh, convolutional filter just in the corner. And by doing this, the result after the convolution is exactly the same as um, the before. The, the, the size of the result of the convolution is exactly the same size as the image we put in. And this is the thing we usually want to have. Um, one note, it's not visible here, because we're introducing this black pixels on the, on the side, we also see somehow on the corners a little bit of darkening. This is not shown here, but this is usually an artifact, so to say. Um, exactly. So there are also other values possible, so that you just replicate the corners and so on, but usually zero padding works quite just fine. Um, when we talk about convolution, we have also to talk about where we apply the convolutions. And here um, comes the stride. So the stride means uh, when we have a stride of one, that we just apply on each pixel the convolution and then get this output. When we have a stride two, we apply the convolution at every second pixel and then get the result like this. So this is the thing that usually you will see in the in the papers talking about how the convolutions are ap applied. So the main uh, components are um, if padding or not padding is applied, um, if this uh, which stride is used. Um, but also the size of the kernel is usually a parameter and um, something like this. So when you, um, now we, until now we just talked about gray images. So for gray images uh, or for one channel images, this is, this is the, the way how it works. So, but now the question is when we have something like an RGB image, which we put in or some other representation, uh, with, which has not one as the, the def of this uh, tensor representation. is how do we apply then the convolution? And the usual way is to just extend by this channel um, um, number the convolutions. So we have now weights for all the different layers. So the convolution is slided as before over the complete image, but we have now also this depth dimension. So usually this is not mentioned in the papers because it's usually just um, the, the input dimension that you get with the convolution. So you, and the important part is the, the, the thing that I want to stress on this slide is that it's always coming out one of these convolutional maps, uh, maps. So that means um, the convolution works really over all channels and you can only slide it in this way. You cannot slide it in a def or something like this, um, but it's usually the case. So for the standard convolution, it just comes out one feature map in the end. And using this, we can then define a so-called convolutional layer. So this is one thing that happens in a convol in convolutional neural network is the, uh, that we have a convolutional layer. So we have the input from before from a, a layer, um, apply different convolutions on it. So something like um, we have a, a number of input layers, uh, input channels like C in, and we have, um, I want to have C out output channels. And then we apply this convolution, we get then the convolved result, which is here in this case a little bit you see a little a high, a higher depth because we have uh, C-out filters. And then the special thing about convolutional networks that makes it um, interesting is that we can then apply activation function on this. And the activation function is just applied element-wise. So that means to each, each element of the, of, the, uh, of the output that we get here. And then we have the result of the convolutional layer. So this is, goes in into a convolutional layer and this comes out. So we usually have um, increasing or decreasing number from um, the input channels to the output channels. And uh, what is not mentioned on the slide, this is 
um, not so important. Uh, or this is important for the learning, but it's not so important for the understanding is that we also have some normalization layer somewhere. So that means um, some normalization is happening so that the features are in a certain, uh, a certain range. Um, just to mention this here when you see it coming up. So speaking of the activation functions, um, the most common one or the most successful one, because it's also simple to implement, which is, was also used in the ImageNet challenge in 2012, was the ReLU, which is just uh, giving in the value. It just computes the max of uh, this value with zero and gives you then such a shape. So you just cut off basically one part of the, the input from the input signal. Um, this has some disadvantages, therefore some people investigated maybe to come, uh, come up with better solutions. So there are a lot of variants and one yeah, often used variant is the so-called leaky ReLU, where you have just a slight slope uh, of this uh, function on the left side. So you're not just having zero there, you have some values that are close to zero and go, going a little bit higher, so uh, getting a little bit larger. So, but there are a lot of different variants and every year shows new variants. So, and showing different uh, advantages, so um, they're still happening a lot in this, in this field also, in this, this small part, the activation function. When we put everything together, we have these convolutional layers, we can now put them together, and this makes then the convolutional neural network. So, applying this, this idea of convolution on uh, the input, um, over and over again, we get the convolutional network. And of course, the special part is uh, that, um, in the end, the weights are not fixed, but they are just learned from data. And this is the machine learning part. And as you can see here, what is usually applied in, in between is some um, uh, operation that shrinks the volume so that you can get, in the end, um, an in increase of the receptive field. So when we talk about receptive field, what do we mean with this? So we have now here the different layers of convolutional network. We have different convolutional layers. And when we look at what a convolution is actually using from the input image, then we can see that uh, this output value is a result of this input values from the layer before. So that means um, basically this value sees some part of the, of the layer before. So, and when we now look at the values in this layer, then we see that this is composed of basically this part of the, the layer before and so on. So you see by going deeper into the network, we're seeing more from the image. And that's the whole idea of doing this layer-wise uh, uh, um, composition of the convolutional neural network. In, in the end, when we did this enough, uh, we can see more from the input image and then can maybe aggregate more information from, from before. But as you can see, the uh, receptive field is only growing as much as the kernel size. And this is maybe something that we don't want to have because to see the whole image, we, need, uh, we would need a really, uh, a really high number of layers. So what is then um, done is the so-called pooling layer. The pooling layer just aggregates the information of a certain region and produces there for a downsampled thing. And when you think of the receptive field before, um, then um, when we have a convolution here, then the convolution sees much more from before. So usually, um, the aggregation is happening by a maximum or by an average. And so to have some example, so here we have a two by two max pooling. That means we are taking um, values in a two by two window into account. And we have here the, the concept from before, the stride two means that we apply it side by side. And um, for the max pooling, we just use this two by two window and take the maximum of this region. So it is in case 14. So and because of the stride, we are not applying it pixel wise, but we are moving it by two pixels to the side and then we get here the, the maximum value of five and so on and so on. And as you can see, the original image, uh, what was, uh, which was six by uh, four is now two by uh, three by two. So it's, uh, the dimension was reduced by half. So this is then uh, given by the, um, the size of the, um, the window that we aggregate over. So um, the last concept we have to cover because it's also happening a lot and when you, when you see the description of the network that actually applied is the fully connected layer or dense layer is also called or sometimes also linear layer um, is that we take all values of the, of the output of a layer into account and pr produce just one number from it. 
And um, using this, this idea, when we uh, would translate it in convolutions, so that's possible, we can, con con uh, we can convert a um, fully connected layer, so that takes all values into account, um, into convolutions. So the convolution would just have the size of the, uh, of the whole image, so that you can only apply one convolution basically on, on top of it. So this will then give you the, um, um, this one number. And then we have then, when we want to have multiple output channels with different uh, weight inputs, then we have to uh, replicate just this, this, this filter. So each filter will have uh, different weights and in the end we can de get the fully connected layer output. Um, so putting this together, so we have the convolutional network, we do some, um, um, we do some, um, uh, pooling in between, we do some fully connected layers and what, what happens then in the end that when we want to produce some numbers which we can then use to uh, learn something. And these numbers are usually um, like for C classes we want to have C logit values. But um, as you might have noticed I just talked the whole time about the architecture. I not talked about anything um, what the network is used for or something like this because this comes with the loss function. So as before, the structure of the networks are somehow defined. There, there are certain recipes you can apply or you can just use the best performing approach from, from ImageNet competition and then um, use just this structure. And the, the, the cool thing about this, you can use the same structure to learn very different things. It just depends on the output that you get out. So on the, what the network is actually learning in the end from the data is determined by the loss function. The loss function determines what objective we want to minimize. So the same network structure can give us very different results when we have a different loss function. And the, this determines actually what the network structure should learn. Um, when you think of it, a neural network, even if it looks complicated, is just in the end of a large function. So you apply um, some layer L1 on the input with some weights and you get out some in output and you do this over and over again so you have a very complex function. And um, this, when we apply on this function the loss, um, the, uh, um, the loss um, compares the output of this function, so this complicated neural network, with the desired value we have, in this case y. And for example the loss function could be something like the um, uh, um, the L2 loss, so it just measures the difference between the output and the, uh, the uh, between the desired value and the output, and it's just the distance. So in this case, the network would produce something like a regression in the end, and you can use then other losses like uh, cross uh, entropy and so on. But you, this is not so important. Important is um, how do we determine now the weights? So as you remember. In the layers, in the different layers, there are different, uh, different filters active and they, they are all initialized with random numbers. But how do we now make sense of this thing that we can learn something from data? And the idea is that um, when we look at the different layers and the weights in the layers, we have here maybe for this layer a specific value. When we modify the value, we can naturally modify when we do the forward pass through the network also the loss functions. And, um, by modifying this value in a certain range, we can then modify the loss function. And the idea is that we want to um, reduce the loss function by uh, modifying the weights. And the thing is, that's why I mention it, because the loss function is a function that is differentiable, we can just use the differentiation to find out which is the change that we should have uh, made for this weight that decreases the loss the, the, most, uh, the, the most. So using this idea, uh, what happens is basically we do a forward pass through the network. So when we go in this direction, we usually speak of the forward pass. We can calculate the loss and then we can use um, the, the loss function and the gradient, which is then computed via back propagation, where we go back through the network and then we can apply weight updates to the weights. So in the forward pass, some information is aggregated that is needed to actually do the back propagation of the gradients. So that means um, in the forward pass some information of the gradients on each layer is aggregated and then we use something like chain rule in the back um, in the backward pass to then update the weights. And this is happening over the whole data set and by this we are learning then the task. Um, 
Luckily, we don't have to implement everything from scratch. So that's the big plus. So when I started my PhD, a lot of the research that was out there was not implemented. So I had to implement it myself. And luckily, this is not needed for um, deep learning networks. So because you have to understand deep learning works only so well because we can use it on a, uh, do it on a GPU. So a graphics processing unit, which really makes it fast to learn stuff with this. And luckily, there are uh, two big frameworks available that are often used. The one by TensorFlow is provided by Google. Um, this PyTorch framework is supported by Facebook. So, um, but both are equally used in, in, in research. So maybe a little bit more. The PyTorch is getting a little bit of the edge currently. But this is um, the, the main frameworks. And there are all of, these imp uh, of all of the things, like the convolutional layers, the normalization layers, the pooling and everything is implemented. And on top of this also the loss function, how to compute it, but also the whole derivation and everything. So um, it's a good starting point. There are also starting points for pro providing you with the, the basic ideas. So the thing is, as I said, I wanted to give you an overview of how convolutional networks are constructed and how how they uh, relate to, to each other and what is happening in there. And to give you also an idea of the terms used usually found in the research papers. And, um, but we could only touch the important parts here. Um, there's more theory, of course, involved there. So um, don't see it as that you get now the whole picture. So um, the, there's more building blocks available. So more activation function, activation function for certain things and so on. And of course, also more best practices, what to use in which situations and so. So there's a growing body of knowledge that is acquired over time. Because as I said, in 2012, basically everyone doing perception tasks and uh, for, from images changed to using convolutional networks. So this is the main thing that people are now using because it's so successful and also has, of course, from the industry also a large drive. Um, for more details on CNNs, we will provide some links and pointers to um, literature, but also or, or maybe videos in the description of this video. Coming back to the object detectors, so we have now covered the convolutional networks. I want now to cover the object detectors, how this whole machinery of the convolutional networks is actually applied in the object detector. Um, the first successful approach really proving that convolutional neural networks could also be used in, in, in detection and really uh, outperform the traditional approaches was the region CNN or RCNN short. And it followed basically the same procedure as before we discussed with the paradigm. So first extracting regions and then the simplest idea you could have to just apply a neural network or a convolutional neural network on this, on this extracted region. So you have the region extracted and then you resize it in a such a size that is maybe like ImageNet, uh, the size of ImageNet. And then you can just put it through a convolutional network. This is specifically trained on some other data set. And uh, the interesting thing is that people found out when we just put images through this thing, then we get the um, output of the fully connected layer and can then use this as feature. And this is then the thing that we can use then for um, classification. So that's the third part. Using this feature representation, we can then train just a normal classifier on top of it. And we already uh, have a, a, a approach that uses the, the power of the convolutional neural networks. Um, for the extra, uh, actual extraction of the um, proposals, uh, we, okay, we just uh, discussed the sliding window approach. And the sliding window approach has, of course, the disadvantage that most of the windows are just lying on areas where no object is happening. So there's no, nothing uh, visible. So most of the things you just have to classify to find out there's nothing. And um, the, the, also what you have maybe noticed is that you have, of course, a specific size of the object in mind. And you want to have also maybe the ability to, to detect small objects, but also maybe larger objects than these Barney boxes. And maybe the aspect ratio is not fitting, so it gets quickly out of hand when you just do sliding window, um, especially in this normal sequential way. So um, you waste a lot of computation and uh, when you want to make it faster, you maybe restrict yourself to sp specific scales or specific strides of the, uh, of the evaluations. But this, of course, uh, interferes with the accuracy of the approach. 
So one cool idea was to the idea of selective search. So here we have a fine to cross aggregation of super pixels. So shown like here. So you just put the whole image through an approach that produces super pixels, which are somehow regions that share some similarity, maybe in color space or gradient space or something like this. And this is really, um, it's more fine than this is shown here, but I, show, I had to draw it myself. So therefore I just restricted to this, to this example. So, um, but the, the idea you will get. So you get a lot of the small regions which share some similarity. And now the idea is to go over these regions um, to aggregate them. So in this example here, these regions have some similarity and this is um, and are the most similar regions basically and then they aggregate it and for those regions we are just then produce a bounding box. And this is done over and over again. So the next maybe this region gives you this, uh, this bounding boxes and so on and so on. And as you can see already from this picture is that this idea produces basically also bounding boxes around objects, which we want in the end. Um, but it also produces binding boxes in different sizes and different scales. So we have very small objects, we have also possible very large objects and so on and so on. And the, this idea gives you the ability to produce proposals that are more likely to lie on an object at different scales and is much, much faster than just applying sliding window. Um, coming back to the RCNN approach, as you have seen, um, we have to basically apply two different stages. So we have to do the uh, train the convolutional neural network, maybe on ImageNet, which takes some time. And then we have to train the um, SVM on top, so the support vector machine, which is just a classification approach. But this is, has to be trained on top. Um, one uh, also disadvantage of this whole pipeline is that we have to extract the regions, resize it, and then put it once through the convolutional network to get the feature vector. And we have to do this basically for each of the bounding boxes. So when we have then something like 2000 bounding boxes, we have to extract this region, put everything through the convolutional network, and this takes some time, even when we use GPUs and fast GPUs. Um, and then we are using these features, then we have to download them and write them maybe on a, on a, on a hard disk drive and then learn on top of this then the SVM or use the SVM. So this resulted at a point in time the uh, work was published, something around, to, uh, to, uh, no, it was published in 2014, that they, the authors reported something like uh, 47 seconds per image for doing the, the detection, which is, of course, 45 seconds is much uh, too long to, uh, to, for driving. And uh, what is also bad in, in this way is that the features are just learned on some different data sets. So uh, they, they are not uh, specifically optimized for the data at hand. So the obvious uh, next step is then to do something on this. So first we have again the extraction of the proposals. That's again done by the selective search. But now the idea is to extract features only once. So we put in the whole image and get a feature volume at a certain level. So we throw away this downsampling on the, on the upper part and just have this uh, feature level here. And then using this feature level, because as you, as you might remember, we're just resizing basically the, the original image, we can then map um, each bounding box in the original image to a bounding box basically on this feature volume. So it just uh, gets a little bit uh, smaller and uh, maybe in and uh, each bounding box on its feature map. That's, that's the cool thing. Because this gives us then the ability and the classifier to just use this region to resize it in a shape that we want so that we have a common shape for all these uh, um, feature volumes that we extracted, then apply for some fully convolutional layers in the end. And then what the approach does is not only provide a, a classification result, so the confidence for different classes, but also uh, some regression. That means that it tries to refine the bounding box that we got from the proposal thing to, um, to make it more, more, um, more tight on the object at, um, that it classifies. So by knowing car, it can then maybe produce a tighter bounding box. Um, the cool thing about this is that we only need now to um, do the convolutional network once. So and then we have the feature volume when we're using the feature for all the classifications. And the second part, as I said, we can use now backpropagation. Um, so backpropagation was the learning part. We can now use the, the loss in the end to drive also the adaption of the features in the uh, convolutional network. And this is uh, really an advantage. So because 
as I said, most data sets at the times were coming from uh, internet images, showing handheld cameras, and they have maybe nothing to do with street scenes in the end, or mostly not to do something with street scenes. So the idea is by using this learning, we can then maybe adapt the task more to yeah, the street scenes at hand. So um, how do we do this region pooling? So we extract this feature volume from this, from this uh, feature volume, this region which correspond to the bounding box. And then we have to bring it in a, in a certain size of k by k. And here the idea is simply uh, that we um, equally subdivide uh, the, the, um, the projection of the bounding box into equal regions and then just take the maximum value of this region. So it's something like maximum pooling, but it's not with a fixed size of the maximum pooling, but it's adaptive. So um, that's the thing. Um, when we come back to the fast RCNN, so it's much, much faster than uh, the, the, um, the um, RCNN because you don't have to do the convolutional network on each of the regions, but you can use what, just one evaluation of the convolutional network. Um, but yeah, you, you maybe have seen the trend, so we're replacing more and more parts by, uh, by, by some neural network representation. So, and this part is only left, basically, so the, the proposal part. So, and um, um, actually, uh, when you look at the numbers, the, the, the generation of the proposals dominates now also the time needed to actually do the, the, the detection in the end. So this can be all done on a GPU, this is still done on a CPU, and CPU can only do it sequentially, the GPU do, uh, do, does everything in parallel. So this is then the dominating factor. So it's something around two seconds, and uh, most of the time is used for uh, the extraction of the proposals. And what is also bad, we can only learn basically the, uh, the, um, the extraction of the features, but we cannot do it with this information something on the proposal generation side. So this is also something that we want to have. So in the end, we want to have some approach that can learn from the image to the output end to end. That's, that's, the, that's the goal usually when we apply neural networks. So, and there came faster RCNN. So this is an addition of the, uh, of the fast RCNN. Uh, it's the faster RCNN that makes it faster in the end. So in there the idea is that we extract as before the features with some convolutional neural network, but then use the features to actually provide regions in the end. So we have the region proposals, we have a small neural network that produces bounding boxes in the, in the feature volume again. So, and as you can see, um, the, the rest of the part we already discussed, so it's the fast RCNN that produces the classification of the uh, bounding boxes, but also a refinement of the bounding boxes. And as you can see, the, the, the representation for generating the region proposals and the representation for uh, generating the, the um, actual detection is basically shared. And um, you might as you might expect now, by sharing this, we can then also use it to train both at the same time. So the region proposal can be used the information from the, uh, or the, the, the loss information from the um, from the uh, detection and, uh, so, and the other way around. And the, the big advantage of this, therefore it's called faster RCNN, is that the proposal generation is now also happening on the GPU. So how does the region proposal network work? So actually we are again on this feature volume extracted from the convolutional neural network and then we just have uh, so-called anchors. So for each location on this feature map, uh, on this um, uh, feature map we have different sized basically um, prototypical uh, binding boxes and we, pro pro we try to produce scores that value each of the binding boxes some objectness score. So that means we want to know how likely is this binding box to have some object inside. And um, together with this, we also estimate some regression on the binding box parameters. So as you might remember from before, we had um, this representation where we had the center of the bounding box and the width and the height. And exactly these are the, are the offsets now. The offsets is working on the center of the bounding box and the width and the height of the bounding box. So coming everything together. So from before the bounding box representation. So we extract this for the, the whole feature map. We have now k anchors. So that gives, you in, gives us in the end two times k scores because we have usually a score for that is an object and that it's not an object because then we can use a softmax on this where we can make a probability out of this. So therefore 2k scores. 
even if we only use maybe one score in the end. Um, and then we have 4k scores because we have 4 offsets for each of the k anchors. So this is what the, what the region proposal network produces and on top of this we can then extract the n top scored anchors um, as region of interest for the fast RCNN. Um, and um, as I said, so by using the same representation for the region proposal network but also for the, uh, 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 the region of interest classifier, we can actually share the features. So that means we can train one and then the other and use uh, this information. And um, actually the, um, the, uh, um, the detection now runs at fast, uh, so fast that we can actually also use it basically in real time. So near real time. So it's something around 10 hertz. Um, but the question that arises, so you, you saw that we had the region proposal network that already produces um, bonding boxes. Um, why do we actually need maybe the second stage? So is the second stage anyway needed? Couldn't we just produce um, the objectness scores and some classification? And it turns out, yeah, we can do it. So this is the approach called uh, you only look once or YOLO, um, which exactly uses this idea. So here, uh, the idea is that we separate the image in uh, a regular grid and we pro produce for each of these grid cells um, one bonding box. And we are using here two anchors basically, and for these two anchors, we are using um, the objectness score again and the offsets again. And we produce for each cell this classification that gives us information about what object is inside there. And then when we want to have the detection out, we just look at the highest scoring classification score and then extract the regions uh, which has the highest objectness score. So both together then gives us the ability to say, okay, something is not in a cell. So when we have a low objectness score, then we don't report on detection. When we have a high objectness score of the bonding boxes, then we have the, um, the, the specific class that we put out. Um, the, the thing to, to, to note here is that we produce only one bonding box per grid cell. So the good thing about this is that we can run the complete network through one convolutional network. And as I said, together with fast GPUs and everything, we get also a very efficient approach that can run up to 144 hertz. So which is really, really fast. But this is a reduce, then also the, the, the performance uh, drops a little bit. So usually you can apply it about 40 to 50 hertz. It's possible um, with a good performance. So, but as I said, um, because we're doing the subdivision and we're producing only per, per, sub, uh, per, per grid cell one bonding box, um, we are also missing some parts because we have some discretization of the image and therefore we have also far less proposals and therefore usually the single stage approaches, while they are really fast, they are also a little bit less accurate because they are just using less proposals. And of course there's, again, when you would need or you would want to have a better accuracy, you have to drive up the subdivision and then you are going again in the direction that it needs more time because you have to just do more and produce more. So that's always the trade-off. So coming back to the data sets and to our evaluation measures, uh, 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 evaluation measures um, when we now evaluate this on the Pascal uh, um, Vox challenge uh, from 2007, um, luckily we have numbers for this, for the different approaches, so which allows us also to compare. So the traditional approach, like the deformable part model, the deformable, deformable part model, um, here the version five. So it has some uh, advancement over the time. Um, gave something around th uh, th uh, 33.7 um, mean and uh, mean average position. Um, and um, as you can see, so there were some approaches in between, but they, they moved maybe the, the needle to 40 percent. Um, but when we apply just the, the, the feature extraction with the CNNs, which is um, um, the, the cool idea, we can already drastically improve the performance. And uh, by using then the ideas from fast earth CNN that we directly learn also the features for the detection and that we can uh, directly extract the features from the, the, the feature pyramid and we don't have this additional support vector machine on top of us that we can even get to 70 percent uh, um, mean average position. And then using the, the idea of faster RCNN, we have also the proposal generation in, inside. We can even get it a little bit further. But you see, it's, uh, it's, um, and the, the improvement is not that much anymore.
but um, then we then compare to YOLO. As I said, the two-stage approaches usually tend to be a little bit more accurate in the end, um, but you have to keep in mind that this approach runs uh, whatever, 140 times uh, faster than this, this approach or 40 times faster than this approach. So this is always the trade-off you have to do. When you want to make it fast, you're maybe not that accurate anymore. Um, having some outlook or other approaches, so uh, recently there are also approaches proposed that not rely on this anchor-based approach, so that you have to provide anchors and then score these anchors and do something on this. You can just use, um, basically, th this is a really cool idea that you just try to predict where is maybe the upper left corner and where is the corresponding right uh, corner and um, right, right bottom corner. And so um, by using this, you can then construct from this a bounding box. So, and this is a, a quite cool idea. And what you can also do on top of this, when you have the detection bounding box, you can use something like mask RCNN to produce also the, uh, the segmentation mask, so the instance pixel-wise segmentation. So these are some approaches. And um, yeah, quite recently, people are also started to really investigate and get really good results on also producing not only 2D bounding boxes, but really 3D bounding boxes in space. So that means you get one image and you want to provide a bounding box in 3D around the, uh, around the, the object that you observe in, uh, in the image. As shown here on the right side, you see the, 3D, uh, the 2D projection of the 3D bounding boxes. And to really, to really uh, um, um, provide you with evidence that this also corresponds to the distance is on the left side shown where it actually is in the three-dimensional space. So it's not only a 2D projection of the thing, but also really a 3D um, uh, coordinate of the bounding box. And as you can see here uh, in this very recent work, uh, this all already works quite well. And um, you even um, in, in, in uh, follow-up work, they even also worked uh, because here you can see the, the bicyclists here on this side and the bicyclists on this side don't get a bounding box. So it was specifically targeted at vehicle uh, object detection. So, but you can also do this, of course, also for the other classes. And here the important thing is to remember that we have the convolutional neural network and the convolutional neural network learns by driven by a, um, a specific loss function. And using this loss function, it learns something about object sizes in the end. So because um, cars have a specific size in images, depending on the, uh, how far they are away. And from this size, you can basically infer how far it, uh, the way it is. It's, of course, not so precise as maybe a LiDAR or a stereo camera setup to, to perceive the depth, but it gives you already the, the impression of um, how far something away is. So I would maybe not use this to parallel park here with this information. But uh, to get an impression where objects are is a good thing. So, and I'm sure the, the field will progress much more in this direction that we have also the 3D information there. Coming back to our perception task, so we cover the object detection and you get a pretty, um, a pretty deep, a deep overview over the detection part. And of course, there are also some other, uh, there's also much more to learn and, um, uh, uh, about the other tasks. As I said, all these tasks are nowadays co uh, covered by convolutional neural networks, so, or tackled by new, using neural networks. So actually, the traffic sign detection was already before 2012 uh, successfully um, reaching superhuman performance, so they were even more accurate than the human annotators, basically. Um, then um, to, to, to detect the, the um, designs. So therefore, this is also quite a major technique. So, but in 2012, it was, um, yeah, basically because people recognized, okay, there's a dramatic change happening. So therefore, all these tasks are nowadays solved and successfully solved. So this was maybe unthinkable that you get semantic segmentation that looks so good in the end um, um, a couple of uh, years ago. So with this, I want to come to an end, so uh, to give you a short summary of the, ta of the stuff we covered here. So we had covered something about the perception stack, looked a little bit at this and the different perception tasks. Um, I introduced uh, the generic uh, object detection framework, which is also used by most of the approaches in some way and maybe replaced by something else uh, in, in the end, like uh, the 
the um, object proposal things and so on. But uh, in a way, it all works like this, that you extract first a region and then classify those regions. Um, we discussed a little bit, I gave a rough overview of the CNN, so a high level overview, but as I said, there's much more to learn and there are whole lectures filled with uh, topics about uh, convolutional networks and how they applied in different ways. And we finally ended with the explanation of the um, modern object detection part. So we have a two stage and single stage approach discussed. Um, with this, uh, I come to an end. Thank you for your attention. And, ah, sorry, I forgot one thing. <laughs> of course, everything uh, you, you saw here is uh, also discussed in the references, uh, which I give always on the left side on, on the slide, so that you can also read when you are more interested in one approach or the other, that you can also get the in-depth information. But with this, I'm coming now to an end. Thank you for your attention.